Hi, I'm Old North Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. One of the issues that's frequently requested for me to cover on this channel, especially by my Patreon supporter, uh, Daniel T, is uh, veterans issues and PTSD in Old Norse literature. This is a somewhat difficult topic to cover because, of course, some of these categories and names are fairly modern, even though the phenomena are old. For example, people have probably experienced something like PTSD for the entirety of the human species, but there's no word in Old Norse that I can really identify as being the equivalent of PTSD. And in fact, PTSD is uh, a new word even in English where people of my grandfather's or great uncle's generation called it shell shock. In the same way, a veteran is a conception that's a little bit alien to Old Norse given that there is not really a period of life when you cease to be potentially a fighter. You might have fought in some engagement, and you might fight in some other engagement. There's not the same expectation that there often is in a contemporary uh, society that you sort of choose when to become and then choose when to leave the society of fighting men. Um, nonetheless, there may be somewhat similar conceptions to, to PTSD in some of the sagas. Um, in the saga of uh, Grettir the Strong, there is a, uh, a sort of undead being, an Oftraganga, again Walker, this is sort of the Norse conception of the zombie, that our hero Grettir fights. And uh, having fought this being, uh, and again, you know, like, uh, I'm not choosing a fantastic scenario because I, I want to. I would look for a more realistic scenario if I could, but the sagas treat zombies as sort of a matter-of-fact aspect of life. So, um, after anyway, after fighting this being, he ends up being afraid of the dark for the rest of his life. And uh, that strikes me as a fairly realistic, I guess, <laughs> response to an unrealistic uh, stimulus. Um, on a more realistic end, in the saga of Ego Skallagrimsson, Ego Saga Skallagrimsson, um, Ego has a uh, particularly uh, gripping reaction to the death of his brother in battle. He is fighting with his brother for King uh, Adelstan in Old English, Adelstein in Old Norse of the English, against a Scottish army. And he sees his brother uh, leading a particular, I suppose you'd say, regiment. Uh, out to, to one flank, and he can't see his brother individually anymore, but he sees the standard of that regiment fall, and so he knows that his brother must have fallen because his brother never would have let the standard fall. And so Egil goes berserk in probably the most literal way that one could, given that he's an old Norse uh, <laughs> a warrior and skald. And afterwards, the battle having been successfully won for the English, Hegel is sitting in the feasting hall, and of course he is himself in no mood, no, no mood for feasting, given that his brother's been killed. And so he sits in the corner, uh, drawing a sword in and out of its scabbard, and alternately raising and lowering each eye. I guess something like this, uh, some kind of intimidating gesture anyway. And um, the king comes over and takes a ring off of his own arm and places it at the end of the sword and hands it out to Egil, who reaches out with his own sword to take uh, the ring back from him. This, of course, does not pay for, does not really compensate him for his brother, except in the sense that the king is offering a, uh, a, a willingness to compensate, which I think is often maybe uh, the most that we can count on. That sacrifice is made uh, are at least appreciated and some symbolic restitution is made. Egil also composes a poem about his fallen brother, which is particularly poignant, particularly emotional for an Old Norse poem. He alludes to the hell now, the, the hellish torment that he endures, but that he must cover much like he covers his own brother in the grave. And that particularly uh, personal poignant note of loss uh, reminds us that uh, the Norse suffered just the same as we do when we lose someone. Now, for the most part, of course, in the sagas, whether the more realistic sagas of Icelanders 
or the more explicitly fantastical mythical heroic sagas heroes are so superhuman uh, that you know they jump higher than everybody else they use a sword better than anybody else they can shoot an arrow further than anybody else and they also seemingly are less afflicted by emotions like grief than we are now that's not a realistic standard but our literature often doesn't realistically depict uh, fighting men and their experiences either right uh, there tends to be either a sort of pandering tone or a sort of um, you know uh, the kind of World War II era movie Stars and Stripes tone that, that, that ignores the suffering and, and somewhere in the middle we lose out on the experiences of real people uh, who have done real heroic acts and I think that um, our own movies do us a disservice in that way as do in a way the sagas right but then they're also not trying to be realistic depictions they're trying to be entertainment just like our our movies are but veterans are celebrated throughout the sagas as of course the ultimate dranger right a dranger is a man who is willing to fight who is uh, recklessly courageous in prosecuting any sort of righteous cause who has a sense of fair play and uh, who doesn't back down from a challenge and of course the ultimate challenge then and now is the challenge of fighting for your own life and survival and the life and survival of those you love and so this veterans day i'm thanking those of you who have served in our armed forces you guys are the real heroes and uh for those of uh those of us who have who have not served um let's go out and and uh buy our favorite veterans a steak or something today all right well from beautiful colorado let me wish you and yours and everyone in this great country all the best <laughs>